airplane broke right at the waist windows. I was stuck in the tail. I, I'm not following you. I mean, I, I understand break, but what do you, you, this it, is in the air? It just broke, yeah. We don't know what happened. The pilot, uh, the co-pilot, he told me, he don't know. He says, he looked back there and there was no tail in the plane airplane. Well, well, how did you land? We didn't. Oh. Was there a sense of, this is it, it's over with? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people tell you stories, and my story was, I said, you know, I says, I got to I gotta pass out before I hit the ground. <laughs> you know, that's before I got out of the turf. I said, I can't hit the ground. <laughs> just, the, just the feeling, you know, that's what came in my mind. Just the thought. I got to pass out before I hit the ground. <laughs> and that's before I bailed out. But you didn't pass out? No. Yeah. So yes. you're laying on the ground, you're bleeding. Yeah. You were able to finally get rid of the gun. What happened next? An old man came by. It was in the woods, forest. And uh, he came back about an hour later with four other guys, three other guys, and they put me on a blanket. Each one carried a corner of the blanket and carried me in. You know, obviously, these weren't German soldiers. No, no, they so were civilians. So you knew that they were civilians. Yeah, they took me to uh, a place called Madhausen, which is a concentration camp in Austria. It's the largest concentration camp in Austria. Was there any communication? Did they? No. All right. So, but did you feel like they were hostile towards you? Did nobody kicked no. you or anything like that? No. They just no. Impersonal. Totally impersonal. Just totally. you were on the ground. They picked they you picked up. Me up they and they're going to take you somewhere. And they gave it to the authorities. These were all men. Madhausen is a, is a place for political prisoners. You know, Jews and things mm -hmm. like that. So uh, I went in there. I had a my eyelid was cut. So they took me into this little place. Uh, it looked like a little hospital room, and uh, they put a couple of stitches in my eyelid. And I seen a three tiers of bunk beds, like, and they were like you seen in, in in a lot of the camps that they were in. I seen yeah. their heads; they would roll their head over, and their eyes. That's all you see. And so you were actually placed in with where the Jews were, right? Incarcerated. They took us all in there, and they kept us there for about three, four days. There were more than you. Oh yeah, all the ones that got shot down, including your crew, that weren't killed. Yeah, there was only two left of my crew besides me. But you saw that, that he was there. You, you saw that uh, yeah. you recognized him and right. you knew, okay. I knew that. And, uh, and then, then the Luftwaffe came and they took us. You're being brought in on a blanket by these civilians. You, they, they just walk up to the entrance of the camp? Is that where they were brought? Yeah, that's where the authorities were, yeah. Okay, and so you're on this, obviously you're in pain and all that, but you're looking around. What are, what are you seeing? When they brought you up there, I seen a bunch of my well, the rest of the guys from my outfit that were were shot down. Okay, and some of them are hurt and some of them are not hurt. They're, they're I was just, the only one. Oh, only so one they're all standing. They're, these guys they're are all standing, standing around, like, yeah. and you're the only one on a blanket. Well, they lifted me up so, so I you could stand, stand up. Yeah. All right. But what are you, what are you seeing? I mean, this is outside of a camp. What are you seeing? The inside of a camp. Right, but what what are you seeing? I seen some soldiers, SS men, and things like that. Guards. So there's like a guard tower. Oh yeah. Were you there in the daytime or the nighttime? Well, it was about ten o'clock in the morning. In the morning. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is full light. Oh yeah. We we used to take off uh, six, seven o'clock in the morning. So then they brought you inside the gates of the camp. Yeah. Are these like big gates would open up like this and then? Yeah, uh, it's kind of vague, but it, yeah, okay. it's a sort of gate, just a regular gate. All right. And immediately they took you to this small room where they kind of treated you for your yeah. you know, superficial Yeah, they just, and, just, yeah, just put that. a couple of stitches in my eye. What about the... Just it didn't do that. Didn't do a damn thing. No. And about three or four days, they got at a temperature of 41, and that's when the Luftwaffe came, and it took me to a a hospital in the city of Linz. You were separated then from the other guys? Yeah. 
Well, those four days that you were there, where, where did you stay? We had a room that was about as big as a bathroom in here. And I was the only one that couldn't stand up. So I had to lay down all the time. And uh, so yeah, that's, that's what we did. We had a bucket to go in one corner, and that was it. You, you mentioned a little bit earlier, unless I'm wrong, that you actually saw some of the Jews that were... Yeah. That was when they first brought you in, right? Yeah. And they brought you into this, these levels. Yeah. What was your reaction, Peter, to seeing these Well, I, I knew it was going on. You know, we knew that uh, they were political prisoners there, but uh, I'd never seen anything like that before. Yeah, I was shocked, really. They were like skeletons. They, they were, you know, no hair on their head, and uh, uh, their eyes were twice as big as normal. Yeah, so it's... Uh, Sad thing to see. So when the Luftwaffe picked you up, how did they treat you? Well, they took me right away to a hospital. So there wasn't any roughing up or anything no. like that. It was a, a never. I, ne I was never mistreated. Okay. Never abused. Always treated, not with dignity, but yeah. treated fair. Yeah. Uh, lack of food is something else. Uh, well, then, all right. Luft they pick you up. They put you in a hospital. Right. Was this a big hospital? Yeah, it was a civilian hospital. It was a Catholic hospital. They had nuns there as nurses. And uh, they had, uh, there was one room, like a ward. And it was about twice the size of this room. And they had about, they had some South African soldiers there. And they had uh, Aussies and they had Canadians. They had a Welsh kid and one kid from New Jersey. And one kid from Arkansas. Nobody you knew, though. Nobody okay. I knew. They'd been there a while. Yeah. Uh, most of them were were uh, were infantry. They were captured at Anzio or uh, you know North yeah. Africa. What was the daily routine like in in the hospital for that period of time? Uh, well, as soon as I got in there, they operated on my knee and they drained it. And uh, were these German doctors? Yeah. So they basically treated the, the oh, yeah, they parts. Treated, they treated it. And I didn't get no anesthetic. They took a couple of shrapnels out of my leg. They were in about an inch they, without no anesthetic. And if you how, do you, it, yeah. how do you take that? I mean, I guess there's not much you well, can do. Yeah, well, <laughs> You're a prisoner yeah. of war. They're digging in there. You know it's got to be taken out. But you just grit your teeth or... That's it. Yeah. yeah. And you don't show too much emotion. That's the main thing. No, they they respect the soldier, and uh, you can act like one. <laughs> they have very little use for you. Well, they transferred us after about of me anyway uh, to uh, what what is called a Red Cross hospital. They had no German soldiers in there or nothing. They had a German soldier with a bicycle that went around the outside. Not a building. It was oh. a camp. There was about a thousand in there. Wow. They had every nationality you could think of. The doctors in there were Italian. They were prisoners too. And they had Serbs, they had uh, Greeks, they had every, every nationality in Europe in that camp. A lot of Russians. One thing about that, most of them were dying from TB. And uh, they had one coffin. And they would, guy would die, they'd put him in a coffin, they put the coffin in the back of a horse and wagon little wagon and they take it to the cemetery, bring the coffin bag, go out again a little later. Most of, most of the Russians, due to malnutrition, but what they died of. I was there for about uh, oh, a week or two. Like, we could talk to anybody we wanted there. There was no, no restrictions. You could actually walk? Yeah, I was with it. It was crutches. Crutches, yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, there was some Canadians there and some English, and they, you would talk to them and they'd tell you what was going on because they'd been there a long time. Did you get fed in the morning, fed in the afternoon? Oh, the food wasn't bad. Yeah? Yeah, it was, was a little bit better. Was it like a chow better. line kind of thing or uh, what? Uh, you get, well, most everything over there is soup. So you get a bowl of soup made with dehydrated vegetables and things like that.
they dehydrated it. The insects that were dehydrated they had the, the shells on it. <laughs> the bugs floating on top. Well, when you first get there, you, you flip them out. <laughs> and after, after a while, while, you start eating shells. And all. From there, we went to Poland. Yeah, by train. But it was a unique thing. One guard and three of us, we were all crippled of some kind or other. We crutches or canes, and we couldn't escape if we wanted to. We had this one guard, and he took us from Linz to Vienna, and he says, you know, he says, if you guys won't escape, a little bit he know that we couldn't, he says, I'll take you to my house, and we're going to have to leave early the next morning while it's still dark so they won't see that I've got prisoners there. So we went over there, he introduced us to his wife, he had a nine-year-old daughter. And uh, the next day we got up when it was still dark and we went to the train station. We stayed there 14 hours before there was a train that had any room for excess baggage like us, you know, to get on. And from there we, we went to a city called Brun in Czechoslovakia. And we stayed in the train station there for about a day. Then, then we got on the train eventually, and we went to Prague. And the guard said, i got to get some sleep. He says, I'm going to take you to this, like a USO for German soldiers. And he kept us there in the corner and had a bunch of those Germans look out after us while he went in the chair and got a few hours of sleep. So how was the USO show? Uh, <laughs> They had a picture of Hitler right in the front, oh, and as soon as they came in there, they'd salute him. And then he'd walk in. You could hear a pin drop in that place. No rowdiness, no nothing. And here the three of us were playing gin rummy with, with German soldiers. And so, now from Prague we went to Dresden. Dresden went to Berlin. Dresden before or after it was bombed? Uh, before. Oh, okay. Beautiful there. Yeah. And he, he really kept us in the prison camp there an Englishman as a cat, while he got an hour of sleep or two. And then we went to Berlin, Stettin on the Oder River, and then we went to this little town where Stalag Bluff 4 was. And as the Russians kept coming closer, they said, anybody that's got any leg injuries, uh, you go, go by train. And we went to Stalag 1, which was in the Baltic. And uh, we went up there, it took us, it wasn't very far, but it, it took us about two weeks to get there. And they, that was the worst treatment you could ever receive. Now, well, Stalag Luft 1 was a pretty good place, but uh, to get there was pretty hard. The German soldier invited you to stay at his own house with his nine-year-old daughter or something like that. What, what happened? I mean, tell me what yeah, happened. Yeah, they just... He knocked on the door, they let us in, they lived in an apartment. And it was dark when we got there from Lenz. And they uh, brought us in the house and we slept on the dining room rug. He, he was an Austrian. He was not a true German and he had a heart condition. And they took him off the Russian front and they had him chasing prisoners. So that's, that's how he got to be. But did the wife look afraid of you, no, or did they just they treated you with oh, absolutely hospitality. Yeah. There were three of us, mind you. One of them is dead. He died about five years ago. The other one is in New Jersey, and I got in touch with him. And uh, I says, "Boy, that was quite a trip we made from Linz to uh, to Starlock Four. He wrote back, he says, I don't remember a thing. Not one thing I remember about the whole trip. So I wrote down about 10 pages, and I'm not a very good writer, but I wrote it down exactly day by day until we got. And he says, and I haven't heard from him since. And I, I wrote him another letter, and still no answer. So either he's dead, or, I don't know what happened, his name was Lackett. 
you know, strange things happen when a, if I, if you tell, if I tell some people this, they won't believe it, you know. But it's true, absolutely true. There were three of us, and the other one remembered everything, and he died. And uh, the other guy, he yeah. can't remember one word wow. or one thing that happened on the trip. On oh, going to Stalagut Four, yeah. we went through Berlin. What was that like? I mean, this is uh, Berlin. This yeah, is the enemy's camp. I know. That was in '44, though. You got to remember. Yeah, but what, what did you see? Ah, uh, it was like. I mean, just a shell of a city. I mean, where the because they bombed everything that, that had a railroad in it. But they would take ten thousand people in a marshalling yard, and in twenty four hours it was completely like new. So they the forced labor basically. They oh, just, that's all forced labor. Yeah, 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 definitely. Now, you're an American airman. You're in a war against the Germans. You're a prisoner of war. Right. And you're traveling through all this devastation. What was your reaction to that? I mean, we're winning? I mean, you feel like we're winning the oh, war? Well, what were you thinking we, about? We had no doubt that the outcome of the war. Okay. We had no doubt at all. I mean, that's the confidence we had. Uh, we would outproduce them, and that's what wins a war, is production. If we produce 100,000 airplanes a year, they could shoot down 50,000. We still have 50,000. But if we shot down one of theirs, they could only produce a half or maybe a quarter of one. Yeah. And that's what wins war, yeah. material. They, they had as many soldiers at the end of the war, they could have started another war. They didn't have any gas, they didn't have any tanks. What was your reaction going through Berlin? Now? Did you go on a truck? Was it? No, it was oh. uh, the train went through okay. the, 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 the first time. Yeah. And then, like, we went to Stettin on the Oder River, which I think the Oder River divides Poland and, and uh, Germany. And, uh, well, it, it was completely a shell of a city. I mean, there was devastation everywhere. Did you see any of the civilian population out the window? Oh, yeah. German people. You don't see very many people out in the street. That was my observation. They'd either be in somewhere or working somewhere, and uh, after we left Stettin, we got near the camp, and we had a walk to where the camp was, and and he met a couple of farmers, and there was no such a thing as green to say, like, good morning or good afternoon. It was Heil Hitler. That was the greeting, and if you didn't respond that way, they'd report you. <laughs> How did you eat going across this whole trail, this trek? They, they gave us a quarter of a loaf of black bread, and that's what we had to eat till we got there. No, no, we got it when we left the camp. Now, it took us about ten days to get Yeah, well, how did you eat during that? Well, that's what we ate. That's what we had in our in our head. In Prague, uh, after we left that little place, we were uh, going to the train station. We went by a bakery, you could smell it, you know, and and this girl came out and she seen in the back of our coats, it was a KGF, which means Kriegskafagen, which means prisoner of war, and uh, she come out there and she asked the guard and she gave us little rolls like that. That must have been like heaven. Like cake. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, just one apiece, and that was it. You would remember that, wouldn't you? That oh, you yeah. would really remember that. That you always remember. I would never forget the smell. Either. How did you communicate with the guard? He spoke a little German, a little English, and by that time I had learned German quite well. I could really? I could hold the conversation, yeah. Wow. And everybody, we all learned a little well, bit. Well, of course, you spoke Italian. Well, that, that helped? It, no. No, okay. Uh, just by hearing it and... Yeah. Yeah, they, they just... Uh, especially in that one camp and in the hospital there. A lot of the prisoners learned German. Did you have any idea where you were going during that 10 days, other than the fact you were going to a prisoner? Yeah, order? but I didn't think it was in Poland. I thought okay. it was in part of Germany. Yeah. But, uh, but it was in Poland. Yeah. And this is Stalag 4. 4, yeah. What was that like? 
Well, there were 10,000 there. About 2,500 were English. They had been in prison. One guy celebrated his, I think his fourth year. <laughs> he got shot down over the English Channel when the war broke out. <laughs> they picked him up and they put him in prison. Oh, the Germans treated him like one of their own. He was like the, the local oh, guy. He's oh, the, yeah. He's the he, oldest he, prisoner of war. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, where were we? You were brought in with the other two guys, right? The right. German guy delivered yeah. you, basically? Yeah, he delivered or The Austrian guy delivered yeah, he, you? He told us, he says, now that we're getting close to the camp, he says, I don't know you. And he said, you ain't way. So I, I remembered his name, that when I come back, came back, I got interrogated, and I told him that uh, I had, uh, what his name was, I forgot it now, but I remembered his name until then. And they... Uh, they're supposed to treat them good, you know. I don't know whether they did or not. Yeah. Okay, this is only airmen that are in this, this camp. Said, just okay. airmen. What did it look like? We're talking about barbed wire, machine guns, guard oh, yeah, dogs. Oh, yeah, guard towers world. all the way around. Okay. It, was, it was carved out of a forest. Okay. Carved out maybe 100 acres. And the camp only took maybe about 20. And so there was a lot of room each way that, uh, you know, if you started to dig, you could... Mm -hmm. But all the barracks were three feet off the ground. And at nighttime, they'd let the dogs loose. And oh. They'd go underneath the barracks, and they'd sniff. Yeah. And, uh, well, oh. I went to this one compound, and, uh, and the three of us, uh, they gave us a, uh, we slept on the floor. As much excelsior as you could gra grab in your hand, starting to come out. It was about October, November. Getting cold. What were you wearing? You said you had this thing with your, your name. I on. had an English uniform oh. because I'd lost all my clothes. Uh, my shoes, as soon as you bam out, your shoes go. And we didn't wear regular shoes. We wore the heated boots mm -hmm. and then the sheep skin boots on top of them. And uh, By this time, what were you wearing? By the time uh, you got An English the, uniform. Okay, so I, English what about shoes? English pants, English shirt. And an overcoat. Okay. What about shoes? Shoes and English shoes. Which is, they look like, they're not boots? Uh, not they boots, were black, yeah. But yeah. not boots? No, not boots. Okay, so no. just like regular shoes? Regular tie shoes, up. yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, no, 200 men to a barrack. Wow. And 20 men to a room. And they had a Badakenfuhrer, which is barracks leader, and a, a Stubenfuhrer, which is a room leader. And that's the way they... They were German? No. Oh. We... we they, there was a room leader then when they had Amongst meetings. the prisoners, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. We had a, you get a hierarchy. Was there, what was the hierarchy in this camp? The highest ranking man was the leader. And this was British? No, well, it could be British, okay. it could be American. But in your case? In our case, it was an American. This was nothing but NCOs. Okay. We weren't allowed to work or nothing like that. Right. Thing. So uh, there was one man that was the head man. And he did all the negotiating, and if there's any illegality going on to the Geneva Convention, he'd, he'd take it up with him. Mm -hmm. And we had committees. One would be, there was a radio that was all in pieces, and they put it together and listened to the news, so we'd get news every night. And uh, it was distributed to us, you know, by mouth. Okay, so yeah. you arrive, and you're on your own. You're on your own. Well, you, you stayed in the room that right. you were assigned to. As a matter of fact, I joined this dollar group four, sort of like a little club, and the guy gave me a cutout or a printout of everybody in my room. And you know, I can't remember <laughs> if that had been 60, 50 years, yeah. These were all Americans? All Americans. Okay. Yeah. So what was the daily routine like at, at Stalag 4? Well, we didn't work. We played bridge most of the time, or played cards of some kind. You had it stand roll call in the morning. And then you were on your own. For exercise, we walked around the perimeter of the camp. No basketball, soccer, baseball no, games? We didn't have like any, that. anything like that, yeah. no. Was there any escape committee or somebody saying, all right, oh, we're Oh, uh, no. All right. no I, not that I know of. Okay. There, there could have been. Yeah. But uh, it, in the first place, uh, we didn't see no sense in it. We knew the war was going to be over soon. And uh, 
Uh, the English who were there years and years and years, they, they, they had a little more organized, but... Uh, um, what were you hearing on the radio? Said, well, the, when the Battle of the Bulge was going on, we heard that. Oh, wow. And, uh, and every new prisoner that come in there, he'd, he'd bring us up to date. So there was one or two coming in every day, maybe a dozen sometimes. And uh, so they'd keep, keep us right. abreast of what was going on, uh, what's the latest song, <laughs> you know, in the country. What about... The Germans themselves. Did you notice any difference in? They're losing. Maybe they don't oh, know. Yeah. But was there any noticeable difference in their behavior towards you? What they, was... they were old men mostly. Oh, mostly okay. older, older guys. The ones on the tower were younger. Yeah. But the ones that went in and, and they didn't carry guns, of course, in the camp. Yeah. They'd get overwhelmed, you know, if yeah. in case anything happened. But the guard towers and they, they had a barbed wire. That stood about ten feet high. And then they had a about a ten foot space. And there was a three foot post all the way around. They had a barbed wire stretched across that. And if you touch that wire, you get shot at. Wow. You know? yeah. So you couldn't even get near the barbed wire. Uh, restrictive. Uh, that's got to that's goes without saying. Uh, confining. You know, they, they, you, you, you don't. You feel like you're hemmed in, you know. You're, but we knew there was an end to it. It wasn't like there was no end, you know. We knew that sooner or later, and when we start hearing the artillery in the distance, we knew something was happening. Was there any apprehension that the Germans might turn on you? Well, yes. We thought that uh, since it was unconditional surrender, they said, well, okay. They got about 100,000 POWs or more. With the infantry and everything else, they got quite a bit more. Well, why not kill all the prisoners if they what they could only get killed once? You know what I mean? You could you could only be shot once for a crime, and uh, that that kept us all through our minds. What, what are we going to do then? You know, so we we weren't going to stay there and let it happen. We'd we'd, we'd fight somehow or other. You know? But uh, that that all oh, that was a rumor, a big rumor. The biggest time when Roosevelt died, the guards were the happiest I've ever seen them. They came in our camp and they said, boy, now what are you going to do without a leader? Yeah, they didn't, they didn't have any idea about how Americans work. Hey, Americans take over. Come hey, on. We could we could have one a month. <laughs> we'd, our government would never change. Couldn't believe it. They were so long with that one leader. What was the the basic end to your in confinement at Solid Four? What happened? Well, uh, they asked anybody had any leg injuries, and they put us all on the train and the rest. So of you them. were still limping around. Yeah, and they put the rest of them on the train. I mean, on the march, the rest of them. Well, I wasn't limping too bad, but I figured it might get inflamed. They marched around four hundred kilometers. So, uh, and I wish I would have marched now. <laughs> but we got on the train, there were 1,500 of us. And all we had to drink for water was snow. One pitcher of snow from boxcar, 40 men. We all got about that much. And we had one bucket that we had to go in. And the guy that went last slept with it. <laughs> The 40 men in a 40 and 8 boxcar, you know, German boxcars are small. And uh, so. How that, long did it take? 11 days. And when the train would stop, they let us out once in a while to take a crap. That's about it. What were you eating? Nothing. <laughs> if you didn't have something in your pocket, you didn't eat nothing. So finally, you get to the Stalag one. Then it's when that's when the, uh, the good things happen. Then we're all officers. There were ten thousand officers, Air Force men, maybe about a thousand English. We had uh, a lot of flying aces there, Gabreski, and uh, Zemke was the commander. He was the highest ranking. He was a full colonel. 
And so he, we got treated a little bit more better. And they put us in wherever they could find a place for us. So you were in a barracks of some kind? Barracks. With a bunch of other guys that are... Uh, the, the, we all came together. Uh, that's where I met my pilot, or my co-pilot. I met him in there. So after all of this, you run into him. Ran, what happened? Well, he, uh, I asked uh, one of the guys, where, where do I find out who's all here, you know? And they said, well, there's a register over there. So his name was on it. So I went over to the barracks. And it was, it was. There was, there was like I said, there was only three. We knew that there was only three left. And uh, the other one was on a march. He marched from Stalag 4. And I came to Stalag 1 where he was. And we'd seen each other every day. Well, hey, just like meeting, <laughs> meeting your brother or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was great. Because I knew he got out, but I'd never seen him. Okay. See, now, when I was in 4, you weren't allowed to go from A compound to B or C. You were in C, you stayed in C. But in one? In one, they let the officers go running around all over. They had good showers, they had everything. Uh, let's see, we got there in February, I think it was. It was there till April. Okay. That's it. There's nothing to say. It's a boring life, believe okay. me. Just like being in solitary confinement. What do you do? You get up, you walk around a little bit to get some exercise. That's it. And you wait for the child to come in, and uh, when the Russians come in, there was a pile of potatoes about 10 feet high, you know. Well, the Russians liberated us. In Stalag 1 now, it's probably the most comfortable environment that you've had, at yeah. least in terms of your POW right. experience. Right. And there's no real feeling of threat? No. Okay. No, not there. Okay. Well, the, well, there's it was always that one, like I mentioned, that undertone of, hey, if it's unconditional surrender, they could only kill the leaders one time. Right. And they could take everybody with them. Yeah. Like they did at the Holocaust or anything like that. They didn't care after they, they start getting them out. Yeah. So there was always, that was an undertone. It, was, it wasn't a real out and out threat. We never heard it from anybody. We, sure. we were just among ourselves. There was a day when the Russians arrived, right? Was there anything that happened before Did the Germans leave? I mean, what happened? We went to bed one night. We got up the next morning. And they used to put shutters on the window. The shutters were closed. And the front door, they put a deal across there the same way with the window. Well, we figured maybe this is the day that uh, they're going to shoot all of us. And we were afraid to get out of our barracks. And uh, finally, we opened one little bit and a little bit more and there was nobody there. There was not a soul. Not a German in sight anywhere. And believe me, they were building a solitary confinement cell made out of bricks. They were laying bricks the night we went to bed. Well, you know, in northern Germany, the latitude is, you know, it's like Alaska. Uh, it gets dark there around noon or one o'clock or two o'clock, you know, it's real real early because you're way up there and uh, so they were laying bread the day before that's tenacity <laughs> so you guys start coming out of the barracks yeah. all around everybody is just everybody got out, out like and we didn't know what to do yeah, yeah. Then we, we didn't know where to go or yeah. what to do maybe they're laying there with tanks and yeah. a mile away you know and uh, then Russian jeep come by and the guys on horses, Russians on horses, and they told us, we got report that you're supposed to stay here and the your government will come here and fly you out. So everybody stayed there except yeah. me and two others. Well, what, what do you guys do? And we followed the Russian army until they <laughs> took Berlin, then just got tired of standing around. <laughs> well, the jeep pulls up, the guy says this thing, all the guys are hanging out, and then you three guys, what'd you do? I mean, you walk up to this guy and say, hey, we went. No, we just took off. You just started walking. That's it. Then we found bicycles, we took bicycles, and we found horses, we'd ride horses, <laughs> hitch riding with the Russians. And when I went to Wismar, 
which is on the Elbe River. That's where I went to the English side. You're with the Russians now. Yeah, not officially. Right, but I mean, you're in a British uniform. Uh, oh, you, yeah. With no gun, with no... No, nothing. Well, how many Russians were with you as you're walking along here? Uh, everything going out of Germany was mechanized. Everything coming into Germany was with horse and wagons. <laughs> And so you're with a horse and wagon group. Well, we we went in, yeah. I pitched a ride with anything. How did you eat? We ate with them. They shared their food. The communication was by mime or yeah. Well, well, well some of them spoke German and oh, some, okay. of them, some of them spoke English. Yeah, there's always somebody in there that speaks. Your what was language. your purpose in doing this? I thought we'd get back to our own lines faster <laughs> than over there. Tired of being in a confined space anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah he was aggravated by captivity. <laughs> <laughs> there was no fighting going on, though. Well, there was a little. A lot of pockets here and there. Pockets but not there. right where you were. Yeah, we went oh, by right. it. Yeah, oh, yeah. They were, they were fighting. They were, I mean, the, the forests in Germany are kind of socialized or mechanized. You know, they, they were planting trees oh, and, yeah. you know, they'd be in there and, and it's you. Firing all over the place, and it went through Berlin. When we got over there, we went all the way to Wismar. You went through Berlin with the Russian army. After they'd taken it, did you recognize the city? Hardly. Yeah. It wasn't a city at all. Every building, you know, they lost eighty thousand dead in that city. <laughs> Unbelievable. They shouldn't have even done that. They could have surrounded the city and starved to death. So you're part of this whole movement of Russians through Berlin. Well, you're walking yeah. through the rubble, basically, right? You're not carrying a weapon at this time, are you? No. Yeah. And no. you still got the other two guys with you? Yeah. Yeah. So was there any incident, anything that you saw in Berlin as you walked? Oh, yeah. We'd, uh, we'd stop sometime and say in a farmhouse, and the, and the Russians would say, hey, you tell us where you're staying, and we would leave that house alone. So we'd get to the house, and they'd say, hey, have you got, have you got any potatoes? Yeah, we got any food? And they say, yeah. So we go there and spend the night there. We tell the Russian, they leave us there. And uh, that's when you hear all kind of stories, which is, just, well, I'd say she was a little lady because I was a young man. Uh, she was maybe about 45. And he had a son that was lost a leg in the Russian front and a nine-year-old boy. And she said that the Russians, three of them, raped her in front of her husband and her sons. And, well, I mean, you take that with a grain of salt, you know, whether it's true, whether it's not. I've never seen it personally. But that's the stories we heard. When I got to Wismar, a couple of young ladies, maybe in their 30s, said, would you take my children across the bridge? So, you know, I grabbed one on one arm, one on the other, and walked across the bridge. The Russians didn't say enough. These are Germans? These are Germans who wanted their kids out of the Russian second. So I took two up across. And they had relatives over there. And then from there, I was in the, in the English section. And, and I went from there to Kiel. And I took an airplane from Kiel to Bath in, in Germany. I mean, in England. They put me in a hospital. And they watched that you didn't eat too much at one time until he got well. And then I got on a boat at Southampton and went, came to the United States. It's interesting now, these sorts of things could never happen, but you didn't need a flight pass. You didn't need, how did you get on these airplanes? I mean, how did you? Oh, they, they, I told them, you know, I'm a POW, I'm POW and I'm trying to get I'm back. And trying to get back. Oh, yeah, come on. Their brain's going in. Just went in. When you left the camp, your co-pilot was still there. Did you talk to him about your leaving? And no. No. Okay, you didn't see him. He just was in that crowd he somewhere. Was, he was in there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, they went to Lucky Strike, which is a place in, in France. And uh, that's where I could have gone to. But it took me about three weeks longer to get back. They all got back to the United States before I did. Yeah, but what an adventure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, there's a lot of stories I could tell. Well, tell them. <laughs> uh, it's, it's redundant, you know, that 
same old thing. Every every woman you meet, or you see, every household you go to, we've been raped and this and that. The Russians are so cruel and you know that that type of ready. When I got to England, of course, I give them my rank, name, and serial number, and they checked, and and uh, and then uh, after I was, they figured it well enough. I went to Southampton, got aboard a ship, and uh, landed in New York. And, Went to Halloran General Hospital. Landed in New York. Statue of Liberty nearby? Oh, yes. What was that like? Uh, glad to get back. And we, they took right away, they put me in Halloran General Hospital, which is on Staten Island. And uh, then from there, they transferred me to Wilmington, South Carolina. And from there, they went to Plattsburgh, New York, and had to wait to get my teeth done, and then uh, got discharged. Where was home? I went to Philadelphia. Okay, back yeah, home. Back Any home. family there? Yeah, my wife. So, what was that like when you finally got home? Well, she came up to, to see me. And In Plattsburgh? Come on. What was what, uh, the I moment you saw her? Come on, hey. Peter. <laughs> After being away for so long, yeah, and had one kid. That you'd not seen before? Or? Yeah, I hadn't, hadn't seen her. So you were in, a, were you in bed in the hospital? When no, they came? no. You were already we, up and around. No, they're always oh, up and around. Okay, yeah. They, they just send you to these places so that they monitor you, monitor, you know. yeah, okay. They want to see how you're Did you know she was coming on that oh, yeah, day? yeah, I called her, yeah. Okay. Where were you when she first came in? In the hospital room? Yeah, or? no, I was, uh, I went to a cousin that lived in Brooklyn. Okay. I took the ferry boat and I met her okay. there. Okay. So she comes in the door with your kid? No, she didn't bring the kid. Oh, uh, okay. Just her. And what did you, what happened? Honeymoon over here. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. And then finally you got a chance to see your child. Yeah. That must have been an amazing moment. Oh, yeah. Let me ask you this, uh, how did you finally get discharged? At Plattsburgh, New York, I, I got discharged on uh, October the 19th, 1945, and I joined in December, so it was almost six full years. Looking back, how did your experience, and I don't mean just the POW or the military or being in, you know, in danger, how did that experience influence you as a person, the person that you are today? How did that affect you? Well, it was my basis of uh, being an honorable person. I, I thought that, uh, that I did something, that I earned my right to be here. And uh, that's about it. It's a good lesson in life. Thank I don't you. want it to happen again. <laughs> <laughs> but I would do it over again, but I wouldn't want it to happen yeah. again. Yeah. No, Peter, thanks a, lot. Through, you're thanks a lot for sitting through this.